Hey, it's Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And we're back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast. We have long time, oh gosh, I guess we could almost call her an M Squared TechCast contributor, you know, like they do on the cable news shows. Kathleen norton Shock is with us today, and she has a guest. Thanks, guys, very much for this opportunity. Um, as I hinted last month, uh, when you had me on for our normal Women in Tech se segment, um, I'd like to, this time, go go out of the box, go out of my normal box, and segue to another topic for a variety of reasons. And that topic will be social media channels, the law, and the First Amendment, and some other things having to do with the law and technology. Um, as you know, Diva Tech Talk, which is my five-year passion project that I co-founded with Nicole Scheffler, took a small hiatus beginning in June, uh, which we will end in September for a variety of reasons. One of them was Nicole is about to have a baby in September, and she just wrote a chapter in a book, and she's busy with Cisco. Um, but on top of that, my interest, my um, a lot of things were happening in my life. And one of them, my personal schedule, was severely impacted by something, um, a venal SLAPP, S-L-A-P-P, -P, lawsuit, in which, quite frankly, I was unjustly embroiled. SLAPP, as I have come to learn, is an acronym for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. Uh, they are, by the way, illegal in 30 of 50 states, but in our lovely state of Michigan, we haven't gotten around yet to banning them. Um, so, as I hinted last week, there's a, last month rather, there's a backstory. I live in Bloomfield Township, Michigan, and in this election year, two of the town's supposed leaders, its supervisor and treasurer, in a Machiavellian political move, chose to bring a $9 million slap against a social media channel called Next Door Neighborhood, for whom I am just one of hundreds of volunteers in Oakland County because they lost a 2019 vote for tax funding and perceived that there was a growing body of opposition to their draconian tactics and non-transparent method of governing. And that, of course, is my opinion. But of course, I'm entitled to my opinion as a citizen and a taxpayer. As part of their political machinations, they named two townships uh, citizens in this egregious proceeding, and I was one of them. Every single assertion in the suit, which was filed in May 2020, about me was an outright lie. I've been paying taxes in Bloomfield Township for 34 years, and even though they get it right on the tax rolls, in the lawsuit they couldn't even spell my name right. This just shows you how sloppy the whole thing was. So to say that this was extremely disturbing would be an understatement. That's the bad news. The good news is that this profound distress led my co-defendant, Valerie Murray, and I to brilliant legal counsel, my guest today, Brian Wassup. Brian is a partner, as you guys both know, at Warner Door Cross and Judd. And he's truly a futurist at heart. He's globally recognized as a thought leader in cutting edge legal issues raised by such things as augmented reality and cloud-based emerging media channels. He regularly publishes blogs. He speaks on these topics to industry groups, legal seminars and conferences across the country. He's also a published book author. I personally, once we found him, found his background and the interactions I was fortunate enough to have with him since May, fascinating. And so with your permission, I'm going to ask him to educate our audience just a little about his tech law specialties. So thanks for joining us, Brian, and thanks for winning our case by getting this spurious slap suit dismissed on August 5th. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, it's my pleasure, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to uh, be involved in this and and be uh, to contribute to vindicating these First Amendment rights, uh, like we got the chance to do in this lawsuit. And of course, thanks to uh, Mike and Matt for having me back on. Good to see you guys again. Yeah. So, can we talk a little bit about your specialties? First of all, from Valerie's and my perspective, and by the way, my co-defendant was Valerie Murray, who's running as a Democrat for Bloomfield Township trustee. First time, uh, she's not a politician. She's a first-time candidate. She has a strong, long history in the township. And like an entire group of people who have become activists over the last three years, she saw a lot of things wrong. So for the first time in her life, she's running for office. Um, so, Brian, we were very lucky that another friend referred us to you. Can you tell me why, from my perspective, you were the ideal lawyer to defend Valerie and I? 
Do you agree with me on that? And why would you say that was? Yeah, I can't wait to hear this, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you, you, as, as we've well established, Kathleen, you are entitled to your opinion. And far be it, far be it from me well to, uh, to restrain you from exercising it. You, you, you've, uh, you've been gracious to uh, withhold your opinion from the public square during the pendency of this lawsuit. And I know that was a challenge, but uh, uh, you, you're, you're free to now. But I, I, so I would not go so far as to characterize myself as ideal. I would say that I was uh, qualified and uh, certainly pitch myself as ideal to, uh, to any potential candidates. But in any event, um, I have been incredibly fortunate over my 20 year legal career thus far to have had the opportunity to work under the wings of uh, senior lawyers with uh, a lot of First Amendment and related uh, not only experience but litigation for me to work in and, uh, and to gain that experience myself firsthand uh, in a number of different uh, FOIA and media law and First Amendment and copyright related lawsuits and um, you got that opportunity to build up. That's not something that is, uh, is a common specialty here in Michigan. It might be in larger uh, media markets, but uh, here in Michigan, uh, I've been fortunate enough to become one of a handful of lawyers that, uh, that really have a resume in doing this kind of thing. So I, I characterized you as a futurist, and I really do believe that, just based on our conversations and the background research I was able to do on you. Um, so tell me, what emerging technology have you been concentrating on lately from a legal perspective? Okay. In other words, I'm sure there are people besides me and Valerie and a lot of other people and a lot of other cases you've worked on um, that have legal implications that are directly related to technology. Can you talk a little bit about that with us? Yeah, well, uh, Mike and Matt know this too because they've been good enough to have me on before to talk about some of this. And one area of uh, technology that's really captured my fascination over the last decade is, is that of augmented reality. Uh, it goes by a few other names now: XR, mixed reality. Uh, the, there's there's more names than than uh, success stories so far in the in the industry, but. It's one that has been bubbling up um, slowly but surely over the last decade and really um, is poised to launch us forward in an order of magnitude um, expansion here in the very near future. And when I talk about augmented reality, I talk about the technology that uh, projects or at least gives the illusion to the user of projecting digital data onto the physical world and allows us to interact with digital data as if it were there physically in front of us. And we see that sort of thing in movies all the time, going all the way back to movies like Terminator and, and, um, and Minority Report and things of that nature. But um, it's not something we necessarily recognize unless we stop to think about it. But, you know, there, the, the rumor mill always, uh, always escalates this time of year before the, the Apple technology show about when Apple's going to come out with smart glasses like some other startup companies have done. And uh, the answer is soon. Uh, Apple and Google and Niantic and, uh, and other companies that are on the forefront of this sort of technology um, are, uh, are, are poised to, to put our smartphones in our glasses. And that, I think, is, is something that's going to, to make a big impact in how we use technology. Hmm. So you probably haven't had a time, given your very busy schedule, to listen to any of our hundred or so Diva Tech Talk podcasts. But everybody who's been a, an interviewee for me, and these guys know it quite well, I always like to know the backstory. Why did you choose to specialize in technology law? And what do you think are the top three hot areas? You already talked about augmented reality and Google Glass, but what are the top three hot areas in addition to that? that will inspire litigation as it relates to technology and or as it relates to freedom of speech. All right. Well, real briefly on the background question, um, like I said, I got a really um, unique opportunity to be exposed to media type law. Um, but it became quickly apparent to me that uh, the, the type of media that I kind of cut my teeth on representing, which was newspapers here in town, uh, uh, one of the biggest papers here and in, in, in media outlets here in town. Um, people aren't going to buy newspapers very much longer, and that, that has certainly become the case. And so I, I needed to direct my energy for the next you know, 20, 30 years of my career on, on media that was up and coming. And that's what led me to not only augmented reality, but other forms of digital media. I was 
back 10 years ago, um, one of the first lawyers to really jump on the bandwagon of social media uh, with, as something that's that, that, that had uh, importance and would have uh, a lot of legal consequences. That certainly has panned out in, in our case, among many others. Um, but looking forward to, to technology related litigation. So um, as you know, Mike knows, uh, I, I handled a case a couple years ago involving a uh, re-regulation in Wisconsin that, that attempted to regulate Pokemon Go and, and other location-based augmented reality games. And that turned out to be um, the first case to uphold First Amendment rights, specifically in the augmented reality space. And that was striking down that law as an unconstitutional restriction of speech in the augmented reality uh, arena. And that, that already kind of broke the seal on, on litigation in that space. But I think in terms of the rest of the broader augmented reality space, I think advertising and, and, and disputes over whether um, I can put my ad on your property or make it seem like it's on your property is, is just something that, that companies uh, speak to me about on a regular basis. Um, and and they're, they're very um, sensitive to the idea that somebody else could uh, take you, make use of their physical space for digital advertising in ways that they don't approve of. So um, that is an area, uh, that's an example of the, the, the motto of following, following the money, right? If, if people are putting money into advertising, their, their commercial reputation is, is very much something that is worth money to them. So it's something that is going to be worth fighting over in litigation. And that's, so it's augmented and digital um, advertising, I think will lead to that sort of litigation. Uh, second, I'd, I'd say privacy. And none of this technology, whether it's it's on your face or in, in other sorts of displays, none of it really works without cameras. And so look at the number of cameras we have in society now compared to a generation ago. Uh, it's an order of magnitude higher. I think it will be another order of magnitude higher 10 years, 20 years from now. Um, the, the, the ability to digitally surveil will only uh, increase. And so with that comes uh, disputes over privacy and the, the creepiness factor involved in that. I, I, you know, now I'm starting to handle um, invasion of privacy claims with drones with flying around with cameras. You know, we're gonna see much more of that sort of thing. And then the third is an area of law that um, kind of is another offshoot of, of my specialty in media practice. And, and it's one that I've had a chance to litigate and will only be litigated more. And that's an area of law called the right of publicity, which is uh, a, an individual person's right to control the commercial exploitation of their identity or their likeness. That's something we see originally in billboard advertising, magazine advertising, and that sort of thing. Now we see it all the time in social media contexts and in, in other digital forms because ultimately you know, we are a social species and we like to talk about ourselves and about each other. And so uh, the expression that we're going to be publishing in the digital space uh, is going to be about ourselves and about other people. And so our ability to control the use of our likenesses, the use of our identities in that space is gonna be uh, increasingly important and increasingly litigated over. I'm afraid yes, we're gonna Brian, have to... I'm, I'm... Yeah, go ahead, man. I was gonna cut them out too, so... Yeah, uh... right. <laughs> Sorry, we've reached the end of the 15 minute segment. Um, obviously, we've gotta have you both back for a half hour segment sometime. Uh, because this is a fascinating topic, and I didn't even get to ask the question that I wanted to ask about artificial intelligence and where you see that going as relates to all this. Hey, we'll save that one for you, Brian, when you come back and tell us another, you know, brilliant lawyer thing. So. And where can people reach you, Brian? WNJ.com, Warner Norcross and Judd. That's my law firm. And, and how about your book? Book called uh, got <clears throat> augmented reality law, privacy, and ethics. Also got a book uh, from a, a faith perspective called What Would Jesus Post on social media. And they're available through Amazon. That's right. Excellent. Traditional okay. four-year students love Lawrence Technological University's thriving campus life, but LTU has always met non-traditional students' needs too. Lawrence Tech offers over 100 degree and certificate programs that can get adult students started or back on track. And most of our classes are conveniently offered evenings at our beautiful Southfield campus or online so you can balance your social, family, and work life even while you power up your career. Lawrence Tech, where blue devils dare.